Welcome back to another video as part of the AP Psychology course. This is lesson number 11 on heredity and behavior, and it will also conclude with a quick look into the evolutionary aspect of our brain biology unit. To get things started, first we must review some basic biological principles, such as uh, the terms that you will see on the following few slides. So we have the chromosome, which is strains of DNA molecules that carry genetic information. And every cell, except for sex cells, are going to contain 46 chromosomes that will operate in 23 pairs. Also, a single cell that is formed by the union of a sperm and egg cell is referred to as a zygote. And when we get to the human development unit, we will actually further study this. Also, you have genes. Genes are your DNA segments, and they serve as the key functional unit in hereditary transmission. So you have a possibility of two types of gene pairs. You have a homozygous condition, which is when you have two of the same genes, and you have a heterozygous condition when you have two different genes. So a dominant gene is going to be expressed when the pair is different. So if you have a gene for brown hair and another gene for blonde hair, the gene, that get, the gene that is going to get expressed is the dominant gene. The recessive gene is going to be masked when the pair is different. So what are some possibilities of things that are actually in the genes? This is one of your possibilities, albeit very rare, especially in the United States, but it would be known as hypertrichosis, and this is also known as the werewolf syndrome. This is actually the case of a 11-year-old female in Thailand, although this picture is now a few years old, and she actually suffered from this condition which caused excessive facial hair growth, and uh, despite any efforts to uh, try to stop this, it would be unsuccessful. She would continue to have a uh, excessive amount of hair that would grow on the face, and so she really chose to just live with this as uh, in their third world country, it wasn't like she had ready, uh, readily available healthcare access to try to experiment with different techniques or have uh, some suggested things that were done like laser hair removal and things like that. Just wouldn't have been an option for her. So this is the case of something that's pretty far-fetched and out there, but it is a possibility. Another one would be the blue skin disorder, although this one has actually been debated quite a bit. Although the uniqueness of this is in looking at the photo, you actually see that some of the family members appear to be blue in nature while some of the other ones appear to be white and so it looks like that the husband himself had uh, the blue skin disorder and the wife did not assuming that the, this is the wife with the cursor over her and some of their children appeared normal and some did not so this is a fairly old photograph some of you may have also seen a man who uh, was deemed like the blue Santa Claus and he did recently die from uh, some type of heart condition I believe but his skin actually turned blue as a result of ingesting silver that was uh, infecting some water that he was drinking over the course of his life and uh, the silver actually bonded with his epidermis or his skin and it's inseparable and so uh, it actually caused the pigment of his skin to turn blue and his hair to turn very silvery. This is a little bit different of a case uh, but uh, just kind of pointing that out for you. So uh, we get to another confusing pair in AP Psychology, the genotype versus the phenotype. And so what I tell my students here is that when you see G for genotype, think about just the gene itself or genetic, ma uh, genetic makeup. But when you see phenotype, you want to think about physical manifestation. So G for, gene, uh, G for gene and genetic makeup and P for physical manifestation. So how do you see it? So your genotype or the genes that you hold is your genetic makeup. For example, you may have two genes for detached earlobes or two genes for brown hair or for blue eyes, etc. The phenotype, though, is how we're going to actually observe it. So the way that I'm going to look at you and I'm going to see what do you have. Do you have brown hair? Do you have blonde hair? Do you have detached earlobes or do you have attached earlobes? Now, it's not always uh, this clear, cut, and dry for some uh, traits, but uh, for many things, it can actually be predicted well in advance of your life actually beginning. And I'll mention this in just a second when we look at some fields of study, but some traits are going to actually be influenced by more than one pair of genes. And so these are going to be referred to as polygenetic traits. And uh, the greatest example of this would be skin color. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can take a look at yourself now if you're white or black or uh, green, red, yellow, whatever color of the rainbow. 
everyone is not exactly the same shade of white or the same shade of black it's just not that simple so we have multiple variations of uh, someone who would be deemed a white person someone could be very tan but still be deemed a white person where someone could be very pale and be deemed a white person or the same thing for a black person so um, skin color is based on a multitude of gene pairs somewhere in the range of three to five Another topic of study in AP Psychology is hereditary influence. And so there are three different research methods that are going to be used to actually look at the hereditary influence that one may have. So we have family studies, which are going to examine blood relatives and see if they have a resemblance of one specific trait. We have twin studies, which are going to compare uh, traits between fraternal and, uh, fraternal and identical twins. And so uh, identical twins are going to actually be created by one zygote which is again a, a, set, a cell that is created from the union of a sperm and egg cell. This zygote is actually going to split for unknown reasons. This is something that still actually baffles scientists today. Or they're going to use uh, fraternal twins, in which case you have two separate eggs fertilized by two different sperm. And so identical twins have 100% of the same exact DNA. They are always the same gender. Um, and this is because they have literally the same exact DNA. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, don't have to be the same gender, and they only share 50% of the same DNA. If you happen to be a fraternal twin, and you have another sibling who is not your twin, you actually have the same genetic makeup with the fraternal twin that you would with the other sibling who is uh, not your fraternal twin. So you have 50% of the same DNA as your fraternal twin, or 50% of the same DNA if you have another sibling. The third uh, study as a research method for hereditary influence is adoption studies. And so you might think of this and be wondering, oh, why would there be an adoption study? What's that going to help prove? But actually, it's going to allow you to compare a child to their adopted parents and their biological parents for resemblance. So um, this is actually a field that is possible for you to study if you're interested in trying to predict um, essentially changes of gene expression uh, that don't involve any types of modification. A field you can go into is known as epigenetics. And so you literally will be studying the heritable changes in gene expression that are not as a result of some type of uh, DNA modification. Uh, genetic mapping is also going to be something that's available to try to figure out the location and chemical sequence of specific genes on a specific chromosome. And so you might actually get to do some type of lab demo with this in your biology class if you have not yet had biology or perhaps if you're in AP biology. And then finally we'll conclude with looking at the evolutionary basis for behavior. And so the main evolutionary person that is going to impact AP psychology is by far Charles Darwin. And so Charles Darwin publishes a famous book on the origin of the species in which he basically documents a lot of different findings about the finches that he observed all along the South American coast. And so Darwin's main ideas are related to things like fitness and reproductive success, natural selection. The basic idea of reproductive success is uh, an organism is relative to the success of a population in terms of reproducing an offspring. And so if the organism's fitness is actually based on how likely it is that they're able to reproduce. Natural selection is probably an idea that you're familiar with. The basic idea here is that there are going to be certain uh, survival and reproductive characteristics that are going to be more likely to pass to future stronger generations. And so basically it is the survival of the fittest. Only the strong survive. And then adaptation, inherited characteristic that is increased in population it solves some type of survival or reproductive problem. And so an adaptation is something made by organisms to ultimately help it become stronger. In some way, solve a problem related to the continuance of that species or solving some type of uh, other survival or reproductive idea. And then lastly, the final concept I want to uh, share with you is known as the critical period. And this girl on the left is known as Jeannie Wiley, and she is a case of uh, a feral child who was rescued and found to be basically in uh, really deplorable circumstances. So she was actually found in a basement of uh, her home where she pretty much lived for her entire life uh, in the presence of uh, 
very little social interaction and confined to basically a potty chair for toilet training. And so uh, when she was found, it was a, a really big conundrum for psychologists because they wanted to be able to study her, but there was also a goal of rehabilitating her and helping her figure out how to communicate. And uh, basically at the time, there was this idea of the critical period hypothesis where it was believed that there is a specific time span in which one must learn to communicate. And if they don't, it becomes inherently more difficult as time goes beyond this and to the point where it basically becomes impossible for someone to learn language or for someone to learn to uh, communicate with language. And so Jeannie Wiley presented this case of, hey, we can now maybe prove that this thing is for real or uh, we can teach this girl how to communicate effectively. We can teach her language. And so they really work with her a whole lot. Um, there's actually a really good documentary about this that you can watch. It's called The Secrets of the Wild Child, and it is available on YouTube, most likely. So I would strongly encourage you to check that out if you're watching this. Uh, it is very sad, but it's also very uh, eye-opening and enlightening, and it looks at some questions of uh, kind of tipping the scale of borderline, was this right or wrong, and uh, the way that she was treated. But in the end, they were unsuccessful. Uh, spoiler alert, but they're unsuccessful in basically teaching her how to communicate effectively. She's unable to learn language and thus they pretty much prove that the critical period hypothesis is legitimate. So there is a specific time span in which the development of an organism's ability to learn language is uh, important. And so this time span is basically two to three years of age. So if you exceed too far beyond two to three years of age and you really have not had any social uh, experience or socialization, it is becoming increasingly difficult to learn language and uh, to the point of almost impossible. And so uh, that was uh, a really instrumental case in kind of giving some credence to the critical period. So this is definitely one to be familiar with. That's pretty much going to conclude this video. Uh, our next and final video for this unit on biological basis of behavior will be a quick recap of some very small things. These are known as neurotransmitters. So I hope that you will uh, continue to check that one out.